Next question? Yep. I have a question about work habits. There you go. Well, you could do it in one to two years. I'm just saying that's the normal. I'm not seeing a three-day implementation. Okay, okay. <laughs> sure. My kids have been top students, hard workers, best actually. Yeah. And that's good. Oh, uh, yeah. Skating? You mean like skipping some of the stuff, just yeah. getting in? You know what? More power to them if they can skip something and still learn it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if he's skating, why isn't the teacher increasing the complexity and challenge of the class? But here's the false assumption. Counting the homework more is going to make him, make him think that homework is important to create self-discipline. That's not... But I don't think that was a thing. I think if they did their homework, they found it led to subsequent achievement. Isn't that right? If they didn't do the homework, they didn't do very well in whatever it was. Would you agree with that? Or no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he doesn't find value in the test and getting a good grade. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is that external extrinsic reward, I do homework, I get a higher grade, this sort of stuff. In the long, yeah, right, because they're so egocentric. The world revolves around me. There's no way that I could possibly do it. They actually learn that if you can make the connection. So you know what, let's try something. I'll bribe you, I'll take you to dinner, I'll buy you something, whatever you want. Do the homework. And let's see what the subsequent achievement is. Good. So let's say they achieve high, they get whatever positive consequences and privileges that come with that. They don't do the homework and they get a, a low performance. Are there negative consequences to that? Things they don't value that they don't want happening to them. Like, oh, you messed up. You now have to go back and relearn the material and do better on the test. No, oh, in general. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, do kids get a report of their work habits? No. Then that would be the problem. See, if they get a separate rendering, a separate report, a separate column, an addendum, here are the number of days you came prepared, here are the number of days you did homework, here's the time you were collaborative, all the times you were not collaborative, times you showed up, all these different things. You had nice, neat work as opposed to sloppy mess. They actually respond to that. But if it's just zero <laughs> and there's no consequence, there's no reporting of it, they don't learn that stuff, the correlation. Well, quite honestly, we have one teacher who had been seven, seven essay assignments behind. Mm -hmm. And he was the teacher who had not. Oh, and giving feedback in response to the kids? At that point, how did the child Yeah, right, exactly. <coughs> yeah, that's really hard. You know what we found with uh, feedback? Here's the magic window, one to three days. I know that's really weird. Pascal said this, if I had more time, I would have written less. In a one-page, two-page writing, I can tell what you know when you write really well compared to three or four pages of lazy writing where you throw everything and hoping something will stick with the teacher. But here's the thing we found. When kids get feedback within one to three days, they actually read the stuff in the margins and internalize it and use it to improve. When they get stuff back weeks later, their eyes glaze over, they just look at the grade and move on. And I'm so guilty of this. Early in my career, I did a, con a project that was so con complex Four weeks later, I was returning the last of them. That's not a proud moment. I hated that. So I decided to shorten my assignments and give kids feedback more quickly. That's what happens with descriptive feedback if you're really focusing on it. Wow, did they start achieving and they were far more motivated. Nothing motivates like success. I don't know if you know this, but motivation is usually defined as whatever you do to the best of your ability what you're already capable of doing, not the stuff you're not. Like if I was teaching you guys something brand new and you were fairly competent at it, you would jump right in and have a good time with it. But if you weren't, if you're feeling incompetent, you would, you would hold back. You wouldn't really do it. So I've got to make competence easily obtainable and show you the value. And I will tell you this, every single time you talk to kids and you want to give them feedback yourself as a parent, let alone as a teacher, focus on decisions they made, not the quality of the work. See, when you judge stuff, the quality, it's a turnoff. Think about this for a moment. 
If you were to give me feedback tonight as a presenter of this stuff, whatever your feelings are towards it, you notice that I was fairly relaxed, I'm fairly candid, and maybe I used humor from time to time. Okay, it was moderately entertaining. You stayed awake, you didn't need the coffee, whatever. You could say this, Rick, I noticed you use humor, and as a result, I stayed engaged for the evening. I, you were candid, and that really helped me sort through my thinking. Great, but what if you just said this, Rick, you're about a B plus. That's not motivating, and I don't want to keep doing what it is because I don't know what's going on, but when you say do the humor stuff or be candid, that gets me excited. I want to keep doing it. What if you said this? Rick, I noticed you keep going back and forth across the front of the room. I keep popping a drama mean just to keep up with you. It's making me dizzy. Stop it. Okay, what you're pointing out is, Rick, you were doing this, and here was the impact. That's not threatening to me. I'll listen to that, and I'll actually change what I do and start standing still. But if you said, Rick, basically a D, I'm not motivated to listen to you. It's the descriptive feedback that is so motivating. Pres professor writes in your eight-page paper, B, very good. And not a single other comment. Aren't you a little bit frustrated with that professor, a little bit mad? I spent like four hours on that one chart on page three. Can't you notice it? It's the feedback that motivates. So when kids get specific feedback on stuff along the way and they're developing the confidence along the way and they see the correlation between meaningful practice leads to meaningful achievement, especially in the long term, they start realizing I get them act together. But in my family, in my students, you don't do the practice and there's a correlating lack of performance on a test, there are consequences for that. And it's okay that you as a parent go in and say, can I just brainstorm with you some possibilities? As opposed to saying, you're doing it wrong. Because everybody would get the defensive walls going up. And sometimes te teachers don't know they're doing something and how it plays out in a family. And you say, I just need to make you aware how this is coming across. You may not know that. And if they're worth their salt, they'll be very open to that. Other question? In the red and then the blue behind you, blue and white behind you. So red, you get to go first. Yeah, you have to do it so it's manageable, not too many categories. Oh, we usually start with just three or four categories that we find really valuable, but sometimes schools get up to like seven or eight. But you know what? With each category, there's probably a separate little document that says, here's what we're kind of looking at there, like effort. One kid's totally scribbled it on his knee on the way under the bus this morning, effort, dashing it off. If some of the kids total three-week bo three body immersion experience. So you, it's really hard, it's very subjective to do effort. How about this, participation in class discussions. Here's what the kid does, because you're taking tally marks as a teacher. Yes, I agree with David. What Lakeisha said. No, you have to add something to the conversation that was not there before. You have to further our understanding. Oh, really? Yeah, it can't just be agree or disagree, you have to take it. Okay, so the teacher's sitting down and saying, maybe even with the kids, what would be a successful criteria? for this, and you usually start with two or three or four categories, but the report card member is just a ballpark indicator. You can't list like everything. So here are the categories. Here's a separate document that lists what we're actually looking for there. That's legitimate. Start with two or three if you want. But what we do, get the community together, your community values. Like we really think it's really important <coughs> that you honor and respect the adults who care for you. So what does that look like when a kid honors you? If he's totally quiet, he's just observing, but that's his way of showing respect but he doesn't engage with you when you talk to him. Is that disrespectful? That might not, he might be an introvert and that's the way he is. And you forcing him to talk like this is actually not nice. So you're gonna have to decide what constitutes that and you might need to change the criteria once in a while for what it is, but it's so helpful to see high performance, high effort. <coughs> cool, it's really validating that I work hard to get high achievement. But what if I saw high achievement, zero or F for effort? Something's weird. Something's going on. But if I didn't dis disaggregate it out, I wouldn't know that. So start with small and go larger if you want. I wouldn't go more than five or six, maybe. Because really, it becomes cumbersome. There's one of me, 185 of them. If I had one kid, I could do that. Or if it was apprentice, journeyman, master craftsman, I could do that. And behind you, blue and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
right here and there. Read my books. No, no, no. <laughs> I will tell you right now, there's no presenter you can hear that will tell you how to do all of that. No video you can watch. No book you can read. It's going to be a collection of different things. But I actually do a whole presentation how you change the culture of a school or a school district. I can send you that PowerPoint. I'm going to be sending it to them. They've already asked for it. And I do it for NASSP, National Association of Secondary School Principals. And I do it for superintendents councils. I do it for ASCD, which is a large professional development organization. And it's really cool stuff, but it is systemic. Like, how do you recover from a heart attack? What are all the things you have to do? Anybody know? Medication, exercise, diet, time and rest, stress management, friend and family support, probably other stuff, therapy, I don't know, whatever it is. But what if I just had friend and family support. Would I totally heal? Go, you're turning blue, but I know you can do it. I believe in you. Recover, heal. No, if I just change diet, it wouldn't work. It's gonna be four, five, six things, not one, that you can do. But I gotta tell you, creating a sense of moral imperative helps. If I gave you graphs and charts, empirical evidence, it would be an intellectual abstraction. It's nice, look at it. But that really doesn't convince people. When I start giving anecdotes of what's fair and unfair, and the morality enters into it, the ethical, suddenly people wake up and go, oh my. And they begin to question current conventional practice. And then I start talking about, how did you learn your craft in your particular field of discipline? And they start telling me the story of that, how they became a lawyer or a mechanic for a local garage, and it has all these wonderful standards-based grading attributes. Let me point that out. And that's kind of what we're doing for the kids. So there's lots of ideas that I've shared in this PowerPoint that I can send to anybody who wants it. Down front? I thought I was on their hand. Okay. Because I want to honor your time, can I just show you some of the questions that were asked? And then we'll close up. Is that okay? And then we'll stop. Those who want to stay can. And then we will provide the answers to the questions. Oh, yeah. If you want the answers to the questions, that's fine. So I'm, I'm can you guys see that from the back row? Is that big enough font? Go ahead and read through that. See if any of those things are gripping. These are ones sent in ahead of time. Rick, what'd you talk about? By the way, is there a GPA with standards-based grading? Totally. It was actually more meaningful. I don't know what this wayward bullet was about. <laughs> Escapee! Can I go to the second slide? Take a look. Okay, here comes a third. For that top one there, there are other people that I point to because they're at the university level and they're conducting a lot of research. My research has been action research at the local level. We're actually responsible in my school district for conducting research in our classes and publishing it with just, you know, in the local community and so on. And, you know, I don't know where any of that stuff is at, at this particular point. <coughs> but when I work with school districts, they tend to look at things over time. And Iowa actually has had several studies where they actually looked at SBG. Here's the weird thing, though. When you do standards-based grading, it affects so many policies, it's hard to isolate that it was the one thing. Like it was there, okay, they made all zeros a 50 on the 100-point scale. That was the thing. That was the good thing or the bad thing. It's hard to do it because they also started Saturday school. They also started doing peer tutoring programs. So it's hard to isolate the one variable. But you get a general idea. Like if, if, if a kid comes up to me and he says, um, did you hear this, this story? And you've heard that story before. Okay? And he starts to tell it to you, do you think about your own state of affairs? <laughs> I don't want to be bored by this. I have to get to the photocopier and there's a coffee machine calling my name. Do I rush the kid through the story and actually say the punchline so we can finish this and I can move on? Or do I realize it's not, me, it's not about me being entertained. It's about the child choosing me to be the adult with whom he connected and was telling the story. And I remember that and I go, oh, wait a minute. 
That's what's going on. See how that's mindset? Well, I know that being tender and kind to a child, I don't have a lot of empirical evidence on it. I just know it's right. And I look in the long run at a long behavior pattern of being kind and tender. The kid actually is much more responsive in the classroom. And we get emotional bridges built between each other. So I know it's very hard and I like having the empirical evidence, but I've vetted that over the past few decades. And I go to Doug Reeves, Tom Gusky, Bob Marzano, John Hattie, and many others to look at the empirical evidence if I need it, and I can send you some of that stuff. And some of it I have on that website on the recommended resources section. Yeah. Well, Fairfax County is my county, and we're standards based. You can look at them. Grand Island, Nebraska. Oh, yeah, more recent. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know what? I will tell you, Ken O'Connor and Tom Gusky and Doug Reeves keep track of the local districts going through it. Grand Island, Nebraska started doing this about eight, nine years ago. Baldensville, New York, was doing it. Now Syracuse is doing it. Lots of different places. Doug and Ken, Doug Reeves, Ken O'Connor, and Tom Gusky will be the ones that say, oh yeah, just last week, this, they're at year three in this district. And that's really cool. I mean, that's very good. I don't have that listing, that clearinghouse, but their websites and their things would have some of that. Okay, here's another one. Did I answer that? I think I did. Excellent kids, gifted, advanced, do wonderfully well because we actually increase the mental dexterity, the things they require, the evidence that's sought, and they can fly higher than anything want. Here's one thing I tell teachers. Kids aren't supposed to get equal to you. They're supposed to surpass you if you're doing your job. But a lot of teachers are guilty of teaching just to get them equal to where they are. In my class, if I'm doing it right, they get beyond what I know, and I become their facilitator. You'll write a better paragraph than I could ever dream of writing. You'll take chemistry farther than I could ever take chemistry. Now, or I mean, when I was your age, and even now. That's the goal. Can you imagine if the kids that we all teach only learn what we in this room know? Society will grind to a halt. <laughs> we will stagnate. The goal is they will be better than us, smarter than us, not equal to us. Is that Des Moines register? Okay. By the way, I didn't change any spelling. Any punctuation is exactly how it was sent to me. Just so you know. I think I addressed that pretty clearly. The greatest is what you know at the end of learning cycle. I don't care what path you took to get there, whether it took you 14 times or two times. Does the military ever do that? Yeah, some recruits, they need about 27 times to disassemble, reassemble assault rifle before they're smooth, and then we're shooting bullets over the head, so they do it under duress. Other kids can do it, under recruits, can do that in about four times, and they're totally copacetic. We do whatever it takes so you are proficient, whatever it takes. And it might be different routes, different levels of pacing, different levels of support. How do teachers feel about making multiple tests? Not very good. But I gotta tell you, there are thousands of ways to assess kids and stuff. And there are whole websites dedicated to like math problem generators, writing prompt generators. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Teach smarter, not harder. It actually gets easier the more you do it. It really does. Let's try this one. Now this one was a pointed one directed at me. Because this person was actually having a Twitter conversation with me, and sometimes it's contentious, and sometimes it's very supportive. But he was just saying, hey, many people have been telling you for years the unintended consequence of SBG. Can I just tell you, that's not true. Nobody's been telling me. I mean, unintended consequence is like, yeah, change is hard. Everybody knows that. And it's so frustrating to write all these tests up, and how do you reduce? Yeah, I know that. But that's just a part of the cultural change. But I gotta tell you, most of the time, in fact, I've never had somebody went into this kicking and screaming over my dead body that once they were there ever wanted to go back. The worst cynic. They actually want to call their former students and apologize. I know how to do it now, come back. <laughs> the negative aspects of SDG are documented by colleges. I, I agree, there's some negative aspects, but I gotta tell you, it's usually because something was intermittent or not done fully, not, the teachers weren't trained or something like that, and it was a big mess. When it's been done properly, colleges actually appreciate it. They do okay. You may not agree with that, I know. 
But it is something that we found in the long term over the decades. So valid concerns, yeah, but definitely resolvable. Here's some other ones that were sent. I don't think I'm ignoring them. I'm acknowledging them. I had those same concerns. But I worked through them. <laughs> Can I tell you right now, anything that's forced down from the top on teachers usually is certain of death. It's something like this. Well, change the program, but not change beliefs. That's a willful act of failure. So you really have to speak to teachers and their beliefs, and parents and their beliefs. You can't just say, here's a new program. But I will tell you this. If you know something is actually far more effective and leads to integrity and ethics, you really believe that, and you don't do it, what goes unachieved in the kids? Can you really look yourself in the mirror? That's hard. That is so hard. Because you like, want to honor the need to change, and change is slow. But these kids are suffering from inappropriate grading. <sighs> That's hard, I know. Remember, cultural change in your own, those of you who don't work in schools, will be really hard too. So let the teachers be human, be supportive, send cupcakes. <laughs> That's going to get quoted by somebody. Your national presenter came in and said, oh, to implement, send cupcakes. He was so flippant and superficial. You have some of their questions? Yes, it's good for them to fail. But failure should be recoverable. That's the difference. See that part in the middle? You know what the farmers get a prescription right the first time? Yeah. Do you think pilots should actually land the plane correctly the first time? <laughs> yeah. That's not their first time filling out the order or landing the plane. Learning is reiterative. And if you're ever allowed to have a plane with passengers, you do hundreds and hundreds of landings and takeoffs in simulators and live planes. But when you're there, when you're certified, and we trust the validity of the test, I can hold you accountable for on-time delivery and high-quality landings and brain surgeries every time. But when you're in the learning cycle, it doesn't teach you high quality and meet the, you know, the deadline every time because I punish you because you fell short in the morphing and the coming to know. How do teachers learn to teach well? They did it a lot. How do you practice law? You do a lot. How do you become a pharmacist? You do it a lot. Not a simplistic algorithm of here's four or five activities. Test on Friday. Theory of the parachute. Theory of the parachute. parachute right. Say it louder so they can all hear. Right, tens all the time. Don't make a mistake on me. It's very interesting to think about that. How to become good at something. So the power of reiteration is actually there. Ken O'Connor admits that to follow SPG, initially the time required for teachers increased. Do you think I've said that too? Yeah, because change is hard. But once you're there, get a little of this. I have more of a life by doing SPG than I did prior to SPG, because prior to it, my kids weren't learning it the first time. I was running around putting out fires. I was doing remediation all the time. I wasn't out for teaching so they learned the stuff. I was out just, here's the curriculum, now I caught you making mistakes, and then I would deal with the emotional turmoil afterwards and the cognitive lack of performance, and then my principal calling in, why do you have all these Fs in your class? What do you do? It was a mess. I started doing standards-based grading. Kids learned it the first time. They took responsibility for themselves. I had a much easier life. In the middle of the week, I'd take my wife out to dinner. I read books for enjoyment, not just the kids' papers. I play sports, not just coach them. Whoa. You have a life as a teacher? Standards-based grading? Yeah, it gets easier. The first two or three years, I won't sugarcoat it. It was hard. Does middling ever happen? The grades, if you have a rubric, suddenly everybody's getting like the threes and the twos, not the fours. Yeah, change your rubric, and that will stop happening. It happened to me. Oh, four is way up there. Blah, blah, blah. I started making the three way up there too, and the four is up there, and it worked. Just change your evaluative criteria for the levels. You, you'll, get, you'll end that middling that happens.
That's true, not everyone can do things at the exact same point, but the goal is I teach everybody to be successful. I have parents say, well, would you do this? What if everybody was successful? What then? Be happy. <laughs> Go on a cruise, I don't care, celebrate. You should be demanding this happens, not fearful. It happens. You have a community. These people you're having in school today are serving you deli meat tomorrow and fixing the brakes in your car and serving you in Congress. They better be highly competent. So these are questions that were asked that I cannot answer because that's more of an Ankeny thing. And I think some of you, you know, are turning into pumpkins and you probably want to go home for the evening. But you can ask this of your administration at any point. What are you doing to implement this stuff? What collected data do you have? Lots of cool stuff. And as a consumer, you know, it's one thing, just be cautious. We pay your taxes, you need to do what we tell Teachers pay their own salaries too because they pay taxes. So it's not an employee-employer relationship. This is a collaboration. This is a community. This stuff. Just understand what a turnoff that is. It doesn't help your cause when you say that. In other words, not that any of you in the room would say that, but just something to think about. So. It's still very okay for you to say, my child is under your influence. Can you just tell me what data you've collected and what you're doing with this? And if they don't have it, say, could I make a suggestion on what data we should collect? You come across as very supportive. That's cool. Even though you're trying to say, really, could you think about this more? Hey, if you want to contact me for a little bit more, a phone call, Google Hangout, or Skype, or if you just want to talk by email, that's the information. Just remember, the time zone difference. <laughs> and I'm a band parent. So after five o'clock, my time, which is four o'clock your time, don't call my house. I'm a dad and a husband first. <laughs> now, can I, some of you are taking pictures of that. Can I, can I close down? Oh, it's on the handout, there you go, ready? Here it is, as they say at the finer cultural elements, that's all folks. Thank you.